rescued your hat. What's going on guys? Hope you're all doing well. Now for today's video, I wanted to talk about something that I really wish I'd gone over a year ago. This is some of the most shocking and insanely cool information that I think I've ever come across for the Jurassic Park franchise and how it was supposed to continue after Jurassic Park 3 and truth be told, after Dominion, really, and I mean, it really disappointed me, especially as someone who was actually on board with the darker ethical and science fiction feel of Fallen Kingdom. I just kind of fell off the Jurassic Park hype after that movie came out. And I gotta say that this abandoned story sounds like it would have been one of the most interesting, original, and coolest ideas Jurassic Park has done in years, and some of the ideas were taken from it for all of the Jurassic World trilogy. When this information came out, I did a very brief video on it, and my friend Yaroslav actually was like, no, Clayton, you gotta, you gotta dive deeper into that. I'm like, dude, I'm not a fan of Dominion. I feel like there's nowhere else to go. He's like, dude, trust me, dive into it. It took me almost a year, but like I said, This was going to follow Jurassic Park 3 as far as the story goes. It picks up immediately where that movie left off with the Pteranodons leaving Isla Sorna. And uh, it sounds incredible. And unfortunately, the shocking information behind it is that uh, a lot of this information did wind up in the Jurassic World movies without any real credit to the ideas, like where these things were coming from. So to basic, let's just to start everything off and get you guys well adapted for what we're going to be talking about here. So believe it or not, everything starts in 1998 with the failure of one of the most revolutionary first-person games ever made, Jurassic Park Trespasser. Now, I've done a complete playthrough of that game on this channel before in the past. I personally love it, and I think it's actually pretty playable today, but when it was released, it of course was a, it was an unfinished mess. Still, fans have always been very positive about the lore and the story of the video game, even getting Richard Attenborough to come back to voice John Hammond with original audio, and they even hired actress Minnie Driver to play as the protagonist, and in the game. Now, it was a big deal when it came out. Spielberg was heavily involved, and despite it being a failure, a lot of people have formed a, a kind of cult classic status around it, myself included. Well, years later, Steven Spielberg actually approached that game's director, Seamus Blackley, about doing a follow-up. Now, Blackley, of course, was extremely upset over what happened with Trespasser. It was a colossal failure that not only affected his career, but it affected, you know, his, his life. And Steven Spielberg kind of just asked Seamus, hey man, uh, you got any, uh, you got any more ideas and you want to take another crack at a Jurassic Park game? And yeah, Seamus hopped on board. It was pretty cool. that They seemed to be pretty good friends. He wrote a story and presented it to Universal. And he basically had the outline of the audience. They don't really want to kill dinosaurs. Like, you just they show up in the game and you shoot them and they fall over and have a death animation. He was not interested in that. He thought it was boring and done to death. And instead, they want to form some sort of relationship with the animals on a more believable sense. Like, the dinosaurs had to be threatening. They had to have some sort of presence that was interesting for the game. Walking with dinosaurs had just just come out and it was really well received and you know they wanted to push the raptors forward from where it started in jurassic park 3 with that sort of relationship back when kathleen kennedy was involved with jurassic park and not star wars uh she asked seamus to make a pitch trailer which is where all of that stuff came out of the quetzalcoatlus invading the mainland and killing people on uh the, you know killing surfers that were stupidly in their path so this picks up right after where jurassic park 3 kind of left off it's actually two years in the future from when it was uh, conceptualized. The story is dinosaurs have been getting off the island. People are not happy about it. The government sends in soldiers to wipe the animals out on Site B and they enlist the help of Billy Brennan, Alessandra Navola's character from Jurassic Park 3, to be a sort of expert uh, guide on the mission. Similar to what Seamus Blackley calls uh, kind of inspired from Stargate, the first movie with Kurt Russell and James Spader. And what, <laughs> what eventually happens is Billy finds finds himself both against the soldier humans and the dinosaurs in the island. An unlikely alliance forms, which basically leads to this all-out war on Isla Sorna. It sounds pretty, uh... 
pretty wild. In fact, from here going forward, I'm going to go over the actual story for the game, which is available to us. Big shout out to Jurassic Time. Derek did a great job at this interview a year ago. Um, I, 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 it took me a long time to get to it, but I'm going to give a link in the description to his channel if you want to hear the full story unedited. So to really get down into it, the outline for the world of this story says that Jurassic Park Trespasser 2 takes place two years from today in a special version of the real world. Exactly as we know it, save that everything that happened in the Jurassic Park movies is true. In this world, the general public knows about and understands the events in the Jurassic Park films in the same sense that it knows about and understands what has gone on in Somalia, Iraq, or the Japanese nuclear crisis. They have the CNN, Fox, USA Today picture of it, consistent with everything else they know of in their world. Thus, everyone knows that there are amazing reanimated dinosaurs living on an island chain somewhere in the ocean far from land. So you can see some dinosaurs maybe if you zoom in on Google Maps maps. There have been news events, people killed horribly, exciting video expert opinions, controversy, conspiracy theories, expose websites, and all the rest. All of this has of course been supplanted by the next exciting event, the next celebrity shoplifting, the next iPad release, the next terrorist attack. In this world, the facts and wonder of the renaissance of the dinosaurs is a once interesting, once ubiquitous, now boring episode like the Cold War or Killer Bees or H1N1. The gameplay in Jurassic Park Trespass or two takes place entirely on the islands of the Jurassic Park movies. Some expository materials such as the opening scenes and some other scenes will take place elsewhere in the world. Now we talk about the dinosaurs. So since the release of the last Jurassic Park movie, the ever-changing nature of dinosaur phylogeny and anatomy has progressed dramatically. New tools and analysis have produced incredible and fascinating new facts and guesses about the appearance, behavior, capabilities, intelligence, and demeanor of the animals. Additionally, our understanding of the ecosystem and environment that created and evolved these creatures has grown exponentially as a new science, aided by database and computational capabilities unavailable a few decades ago. The good news is that we have a wonderful new palette of colorations, body types, behaviors, capabilities, and even species with which to delight and surprise the audience. The bad news is, how do we explain this sudden change in all the dinosaurs since the first movie? Well, Jurassic Park 3 sort of snuck some changes in, with proto feathers and bright coloration onto the extant forms that the audience had seen before. But the modern forms and colorations we know about today are far more divergent and also far more awesome than we could ever sneak in like this. Fortunately for us, nature comes to the rescue and comes in a very Michael Crichton way, so perfect in point of fact that it would be problematic were we not to include it into our thinking, even absent our new knowledge of these animals. Here's the deal, we know vastly more about DNA and the specific mechanics of DNA than we did two decades ago. We have better understanding of the reasons and processes that cause DNA to change, and we understand now that there's a surprising amount of redundant and even seemingly useless data carried around alongside the precious bits needed to actually build an organism. Long story short, this DNA would eventually start breeding out the old genes and breeding in the prehistoric ones, which is why the dinosaurs look so different in Jurassic Park 3. All of the dinosaurs would eventually be breeding into their more prehistoric selves, and it's a pretty cool idea. He said he'll save us the science lecture unless you want it, but the bottom line is that when the engine scientist got this all to work by splicing missing chains with frog sequences, what they were actually doing was engineering in mistakes and preconceptions of what they thought the animals should look like and not what they really were. And it would only take one or two generations of any given species before its true characteristics would emerge violently and resolutely. As an example, the daughter of the first dominant male in the Velociraptor clans, whom we meet in Jurassic Park 3, would be different, but more brightly colored, faster, better than her parents. And her daughter, whom we meet in our story, would be absolutely exceptional. Additionally, not every DNA sample that engine discovered is what they thought it was. There were, for instance, tens of varieties of theropod that looked generally like T-Rex. So again, like after a generation or two, we would start to see an explosion of diversity on Isla Sorna. In summary, they're able to explore some very exciting novel morphology, novel behavior, and also some novel emphasis on new kinds of animals, like pterosaurs and ichthyosaurs, which sounds extremely interesting to me. So the story is that some Quetzalcoatlus escape from the island. Consider for a moment that after the 
release of Jurassic Park 3, the Pteranodons got out of the aviary on Isla Sorna, and uh, after a generation of becoming more themselves genetically, a quick two or three thousand mile trip to easier hunting grounds is no big deal for these guys. Similarly, Liaplorodon, the 40 foot long, 25 ton Tyrannosaurus of the sea, once out of their tanks on Site B, would find our modern world a wonderful fantasy land of easy but disappointingly small prey. The story's timeline coincides with the arrival of the Quetzalcoatlus and Liaplorodon in the skies on the shores of the United States, the first country in which the unexplained disappearances of people and large animals are taken seriously, and the first in which there are sufficient government resources to investigate. They eventually kill people, and in short, the ignored problem of the dinosaur islands comes back to the forefront. Something must be done. Outscale fonts appear on papers and news homepages. Students protest. Officials appear on talk shows. Dr. Billy Brennan, Alessandro Nivola's character from Jurassic Park 3, gets a call. A mission is being mounted to see what's happening on the Engine Islands, and to develop a plan for dealing with this mess. Billy has been struggling for several years to string along funding for his research on theropod vocalizations, communications, and group behavior, and is, in the moments when he's completely honest with himself, at the end of his rope. So this is post-Jurassic Park 3 with a little raptor resonating chamber. He's trying to get more research done on it, but he, you know, has nowhere to go. He meets with Admiral Nellis, the Boy Scout mission commander, who was going to be voiced, uh, allegedly, that they wanted to get Bradley Cooper as the bad guy. They were going to offer him the role. Brennan is just the right kind of slightly opportunistic and slightly desperate, highly trained and experienced man for this job. We show up on Isla Sorna to see it positively teeming with amazing ancient life. Every barrier, containment vessel, security perimeter, fence, ditch, well, gate, tank, and pin has been gleefully defeated by the incredible unexpected capabilities of these creatures. It's abundantly clear why the only thing that was ever able to compete with them was a rock from the sky the size of Manhattan. The audience is blown away by the awesome beauty of this ecosystem. We land, disembark, and start setting up camps and security perimeters. As crates are unpacked and personnel arrive, it becomes increasingly clear that this effort has nothing at all to do with research, information, or mitigation. It has to do with extermination and keeping a very few species to be sealed deep underground or frozen. So I can imagine the beginning of this story would be Billy on the island with all of the military personnel kind of lying to him about why they're really there. This was kind of used in Fallen Kingdom with the double cross where Owen finds out that they're there to only extract dinosaurs from the island and sell them. This time they were going to kill them all. Brennan is of course only now given the ultimatum. Help us do this or kiss your funding goodbye. Possibly forever. Billy equivocates. Then he watches a series of particularly egregious murders of beautiful dinosaurs. Think what happened in the roundup scene of The Lost World, only instead of catching them, they're just guns blazes exterminating them. They're tired of people getting killed by dinosaurs in the mainland. They've kind of lied to Billy to get him on the island as a guide, and now they're full force attacking them. And Billy can't take it anymore. He, he has a childlike fit, born of real compassion because he loves dinosaurs, so he either kills or disables one of his handlers and runs panicked into the forest. I don't know how that was supposed to play out, but it, this sounds a lot like the plot of Avatar, to tell you the truth. Chase is given two men with shotguns trying to decide if they're more frightened of their commanders or of the jungle enter the tree line. Brennan is terrified at what's been going on. He stumbles, tumbles, and makes generally enough noise that there's no way he's getting anything but shot. They're after him. He sprints to seek better cover and trips spectacularly, flipping, cutting a gash in his face and landing at the base of an enormous ancient tree. He crouches behind it and notices something about the log that he's just tripped over. It's actually a velociraptor nest. Now he knows... He really knows that he's dead. And the idiot shotgun goons are probably going to be dead too. Suddenly, they're on him. The lead goon miraculously or tragically also trips across the nest. And this time, the eggs go flying. With the desperation of the doomed Billy clumsily, comically, and much to his own surprise, getting the better of him, he gets the shotgun free and manages to chase them both off by liberally wasting ammo into the treetops. He doesn't want to kill anybody. He's just like, leave, go away, don't kill me, don't kill me. Okay, so he turns around and of course, there she is. She is is exactly as tall as he is. She's staring directly into his eyes. She's blue and turquoise, magnificently fearsome, calm, 
and powerful. She's incredibly beautiful. She breaks eye contact and looks at her eggs. We follow Brennan tracking her gaze. She looks back up and they stare at each other. Brennan shrugs and smiles. He's gonna die here. The shotgun is like no use. Th this, this raptor's about to kill him. But he's mesmerized. This is not remotely like any dinosaur we've ever seen. Much more evolved than what we saw in Jurassic Park 3. And then he realizes why he isn't dead yet. She thinks he saved her eggs. Then a male velociraptor crashes into the scene. He looks to pounce without breaking eye contact. She barks at the raptor and he backs away, just like Jurassic Park 3. Only then does she look away to glance at the other raptor. She barks again, this time in a more complex way. The male relaxes and turns to look Brennan in the eye, just as the rest of the pack arrives. This is scary. <laughs> the dominant female has decided, for reasons we'll discover as the game progresses, that Billy has become, whether he likes it or not, an honorary member of the pack. Uh, only on a trial basis, though. Billy does not understand any of this. He finds this relationship with the raptors ludicrous at best and suicidal at worst, and goes about trying to survive and to find a way off of the island by avoiding them as much as possible and using conventional means, sneaking around, stealing guns, trying to steal a radio, a boat, a jeep, anything. But the invasion force is simply too powerful. These guys have all the tech and equipment. They're too well equipped, they're too ruthless, and the dominant female, the princess as this is called, and her tribe seem to be constantly watching him. They're keeping tabs on him. It's creepy as hell. He's over there trying to steal a radio or something or grab some ammunition and he just, I can picture like raptor eyes staring at him like, what are you doing man? We, we don't really like you but we're not gonna kill you yet. So he retreats into the jungle after his third failed mission and having successfully but desperately run away from soldiers who discover him trying to hotwire a Humvee. Britton stops to rest. His head is bowed. He has no idea what to do next. He looks up and and sees one of the raptors 50 feet away looking towards him. Dude, what's going on? He's at his limit. The raptor barks sharply and Billy mockingly barks back and then jerks upright, hitting his head in a large branch. And as his bark is repeated twice, very loud, right behind him, he spins to see a camouflaged soldier 10 feet away, brutally and instantaneously disassembled by a big female raptor. He had no idea he was even being followed. He had no idea there were raptors around him. He clearly had no idea about anything. The female steps on the soldier's chest and deftly pulls his arm off. She looks at Billy and wiggles her head. The arm flops around revoltingly in her mouth. She looks happy. It's weird. The male, now walking toward the scene, barks again. A different, longer sound. Billy's starting to understand what's going on here. So Billy sees that this is his only hope for survival. He's got to use this weird relationship with the raptors to somehow overcome the humans. By necessity, he starts to try to communicate more proactively with the raptors and learns over time to work with them as a squad, as a weapon. I guess you'd have like a button on your controller of like, all right, raptors go that way. And they'd like go off and attack soldiers or something. He names them, learns their calls and their call for him. And Seamus Blackley actually said it was very disappointing when the stuff came out about Jurassic World. It was disheartening to see that they, they took a lot of this information and they put it on the poster for the new movie. They even named the raptor Blue, which apparently came from him. Throughout this learning process, humans come to find him, to capture him and to kill the raptors. They subsequently deduce that he's turned, at which point they simply come to kill him however they can. You know, they just want to kill Billy. They're like, okay, get rid of this guy. He's a terrible thing in our operation. And uh, they've got snipers, they've got helicopters and APCs. They're becoming increasingly aggressive, increasingly cruel, increasingly <laughs> destructive. And uh, through the first two thirds of the game, this bonds him to the Velociraptor pack and to the island which he gets more acquainted with and the defense of this ecosystem. We also develop the character of Admiral Nellis who is uh, Bradley Cooper, that's who he was supposed to be, and his increasingly irrational obsession with killing Brennan. This sounds a lot like Avatar. Billy and the pack also face threats from the large theropods, pterosaurs, and all the dangers of the ancient food chain which we can show in its new genetically re-expressed glory. Pack members are killed, Billy is always near death, all throughout Billy's relationship with the princess grows, largely through the gameplay dynamic of his command and response library and the dangers and puzzles of the missions that they face together. Although Brennan does find human weapons scattered on the island both in catches and as prizes from killing the armed forces, his most powerful weapon of course is the raptors. As the game progresses and more of the ecosystem becomes available, that weapon begins to include certain animals that the pack engages at different times in different areas, ultimately including all the big animals. So I guess you could use the raptors to like scare up some triceratops 
Cyclops and they lead them to attack men or maybe even there's some Raptor, uh, Velociraptor, maybe Utah Raptor lingo going on where an unlikely alliance between the tribes comes together. In the end, Billy is increasingly at the center of the dinosaur stand against the human execution force and a large decisive conflict is inevitable. Apparently we come across some Tyrannosaurs. Some of them, I have no idea how this works, end up being on Billy's side. I guess through some, I don't, I don't know, but the, not all of them. Some of the T-Rexes are bad and they just decide to kill anything they come across like normal T-Rexes. Very aggressive, very deadly. But at the end, some of the people, you got Billy, you got some Velociraptors, a Spinosaurus, the Tyrannosaurus, the Quetzalcoatlus, the Triceratops. It all comes together in a gigantic deadly arsenal of the geologic past pitted against tanks, helicopters, chain guns, radios, and it's just supposed to be this chaotic battle. This is true chaos where all the animals are killing everybody. There is no real faction. It sounds like insanity on Isla Sorna. The ultimate aim of the gameplay is to upturn the paradigm and enable the player to directly experience the power and feel of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs through clever use and variation of proven gameplay and tech. This sounds so different from anything we ever got, and it basically is Guy gets lost on the island as a guide, there's a double cross, he ends up befriending the raptors, and again, a lot of this stuff looks a lot like what they used in the Jurassic World movies, and apparently, uh, Frank Marshall even asked Seamus, he's like, hey, you got anything else when they were developing Fallen Kingdom, and he just didn't have anything, he had already given them everything, so they, they really did retroactively take the Jurassic World. That title also comes from Trespasser 2. They took that and they kind of just wound up making, they scrapped the game and made the trilogy. To put it very very bluntly. Now, like I said before, they did develop the trailer with the Quetzalcoatlus picking people off the coast. And uh, again, Seamus was like, dude, they even used the Mosasaur, like picking people off in the water with the surfers in the trailer for Fallen King. Can you imagine what that must have felt like to have all of your work kind of just kind of like repurposed for that? I like this story a lot. There's tons of concept art and uh, it looks like a lot of it did wind up in movie posters and stuff. It was very interesting. They were going to offer Alessandro Nivola uh, the role. He was going to get full uh, you know, accreditation for like an acting job. The raptors from Jurassic Park 3 are revealed as having been beginning to evolve back into their prehistoric selves. This, this feels like a true uh, follow-up to JP3 in a big way. My only thing that I would ask is, I think it would have been cool to at least have like some sort of inclusion of Alan Grant, Ian Malcolm, or, or even Ellie through some way, obviously maybe not on the island, but maybe through radio conversations like, Billy, where are you? You know, kind of like how Ellie and Grant communicated in Jurassic Park 3 with a satellite phone. And the story is like, put Lost World Jurassic Park and Jurassic Park 3 in a blender and give it the Avatar flair of just wild, crazy military battle on the island with dinosaurs everywhere. It sounds insane and actually you know at glance i don't i don't really know how the animals would realistically uh i don't know how i would buy them all being on billy's side but i'm going to give the game the credit i'm gonna i'm gonna believe that they probably had a smart idea to really express that tyrannosaurs were incredibly intelligent they probably uh, they probably had a good idea on how to make it all work and it sounds like it would have been great man it sounds like it would have redeemed jurassic park trespasser it sounds like a great sequel to jurassic Park 3, and um, I'm not going to lie, I kind of wish that this was a movie. The, the funny thing about this, and uh, I know I recently did a video on why I would love Spielberg to come back and direct a movie. Imagine if he did this movie, if he called it something like Site B, Jurassic Park, and it was set in between Jurassic Park 3 and Jurassic World. And the whole point was like, just imagine this was the build up to Jurassic World. You could get Billy back, you wouldn't even have to de-age Sam Neill or uh, you know Jeff Goldblum or anybody because they could all be like off camera somewhere. This story sounds great and they did want to turn everything here into a movie. Somebody got fired at Universal. I believe it was the, the head of the company and yeah, what basically happened was they said that we don't want to make a game. We want to make a new movie. Steven wants to make several new movies. And the the idea to do Jurassic Park 4, of course, I've done tons of videos before on this in the past. They wanted to have a raptor squad with the name Red. So I guess they replaced Blue that Seamus Blackley had, which was a fully feathered turquoise heavily evolved raptor into Red, which was like a JP3 variant, which would lead the open theme park team that was for Jurassic Park 4. But when Colin got involved, it looks like he switched the name of the raptor back to Blue from what Seamus had written down in his, you know, 
big symposium of ideas. And then they, they used a lot of ideas and concept art. I'm assuming they just kind of turned everything over to Trevorrow when he rewrote the Jurassic Park 4 script for his own project. And yeah, you can see in Fallen Kingdom, th that's a lot of the stuff there, man. They did repurpose like the betrayal on the island where they went there with a bunch of guns and stuff like that. Only, you know, it's slightly different to fit their own story. I love this. This is a great idea and I, I kind of want this to happen still. I don't know how it could and I I think that it's just it's just enough believability for me because the raptors always keeping tabs on billy and they they could kill him at any moment and he's become like an honorary member of the pack but not not really because it's kind of scary <laughs> um it's a cool idea and i i really think that it's a shame that they took this this great concept for trespasser 2 and then kind of uh gutted it when the head of universal got fired and they said we're not making a game we want to make a movie and they just ran in the direction of repurposing this stuff for the Jurassic World trilogy. This looks like the big missing link. I think that the idea of the Raptors being used in a military purpose was then, it was more accurately used here with the Billy Brennan plot, and then they gutted that when Universal got different people involved and wanted to make a movie. So this is the missing piece between JP4 from 2003 or 4 to Jurassic Park 4 from the early 2010s. Awesome stuff. There's even some cool stuff uh as far as Seamus Blackley's wife goes believe it or not they've been involved with Jurassic Park even since the first movie man and that joke of do you think he's Saurus comes from Seamus's wife who was working on the original Jurassic Park she just told that dad joke to Steven Spielberg and he liked it so much he put it in the movie things happen for a reason I know the failures of Jurassic Park Trespasser and Jurassic World the Trespasser 2 pitch are probably fresh on Seamus Blackley's mind and spirit really but uh maybe that was what God had planned originally for him to really have that relationship with his wife and it's just cool to see how all of this stuff works out in mysterious ways and hear that it's available to the public after the release of Jurassic World Dominion I think it's cool man this has actually really reinvigorated my love of classic Jurassic stuff uh, not only from the literature of Michael Crichton's books but the science and the actual cool stuff going on with Billy Brennan in this post Jurassic Park 3 story again I, I'd love to see it in a movie Jurassic World War or something and uh, that the imagery of dino rider material always put me off but this sounds like it was more just chaos happening on the island just absolutely insanely wild stuff and yeah i uh, uh that's all i got to say about it guys this is a crazy link in the jurassic park history that i wish more people talked about i wish i talked about it earlier man but dominion really burned me and i don't want to talk about my disappoints my disappointments with that forever but this is truly cool and the truth about its production cancellation all that stuff can be found on jurassic time that channel i will leave a link of in the description i hope you all enjoyed this presentation and uh, I, I can't wait to see what comes of Jurassic in the future because it looks like they're going to rebrand and kind of reshift focus. This sounds cool. Anyways, guys, whatever your own thoughts and opinions happen to be on the uh, truth about this abandoned sequel to Jurassic Park 3, I'd love to hear all about them and its repurposing to the Jurassic World movies in the comments down below. Now, before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens and engine executives as well as all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. You've all helped my channel immensely, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of that support. Now I'd like to thank you all for watching today's video and hope that you enjoyed the content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you all consider subscribing. I'll see you all in the next video, guys, and as always, take it easy.